Now, Dr. Shingupta, it's up to you. All right. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Shantanu Boshu, um, Shantanu Basu, HOD, Department of English, Yakhandu Mishan Mohabit Dalai, for giving me this opportunity to interact with your students. I also thank Dr. Amrita Banerjee, Assistant Professor, and my longtime friend. Um, I also thank other colleagues in the department, our fellow travelers in the path of literature, and my dear students who are present here um, uh, for this particular talk. Um, I hope uh, the presentation, uh, my PPT, is uh, visible to you. Uh, can someone kind of uh, verify whether it is visible or not? Yes, sir, yes it, is. it is visible. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I intend to discuss with you some aspects of the development of European novel in the 19th century. Now, we know that such discussions can be quite exhaustive, and some of it might be beyond the limited scope of this present enterprise. Now, I would stress, as, as Dr. Basu had pointed out, on one particular aspect of 19th century European novel, its so-called embodiment of realism. Now, this choice of a single lens perhaps requires some explanation. Uh, for example, why not discuss romance in 19th century novel, which would perhaps be a far more promising proposition, or economy, or football, or art, or religion. I have, however, thought of realism as the term marks out the course that you have studied, the DSC 1, 19th century European realism. Moreover, our temporal limitations also compel us to limit discussions on two novels in your syllabus, uh, Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary, which had been serialized in 1856 in French, uh, and Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, which had been initially serialized in 1866 in Russian. Um, though we would try to touch upon some of the other novels and novelists, and here let me kind of confess that my knowledge of French and Russian um, is quite rudimentary, and I would deal with these texts uh, primarily through translations. I would use the Constance Garnet translation um, uh, for uh, Crime and Punishment and uh, the Margaret Malden translation for Madame Bovary. Um, now, when we use the word realism and associated word, words, realist or realistic, we seem to have a sufficient comprehension of these terms in mind. Now, we may have tried to supplement this later, students of literature, this vague common sense understanding of the realist by reading entries about the term from literary guides or anthologies. Surely such entries point us to a direction, but they often raise more questions than they answer. Uh, for example, when do we actually enter the realist phase in artistic or literary representation? Is it in the Renaissance, as far as painting is concerned? Is it in the Renaissance with Giotto in the 14th century or with the Flemish masters in the 15th? Or is it much later with Caravaggio and his ilk? and the dark, stormier aspects of existence, of human existence being portrayed in the 17th century? Or is it with the Dutch golden age of painting with Vermeer and Rembrandt? Or is it Gustave Courbet and Jean-Francois Millet in the 19th century, who in their depiction of rural life of farmers and workers presented a non-idealized portrait of the human body? How to pinpoint realism in art? And similar questions can be asked while considering literature, and even if we limit ourselves to the jar, like the novel. What is realism? Is it the depiction of detailed verisimilitude of everyday life, which we discover in early 18th century novels of Defoe, Robinson Crusoe, Journal of the Plague Year? Are these the true pioneering efforts of literary realism? Or can we trace it even earlier in the superbly anti-chivalric misadventures of Don Quixote, first, first part published in 1605? Or should we trace it in fielding in the history of Tom Jones in mid-18th century? 
Are we demanding a certain complexity of character portrayal, perhaps, the likes of which we discover in Dean Austin's fiction? Or are we expecting the representation of socio-economic turmoil brought about by the French Revolution and later the Industrial Revolution to make a novel sufficiently realistic? Do we have in mind, for example, Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South or Dickens's Hard Times? Which of these qualities can be pinpointed as realist? And what would we mean by that word? Now, let me reiterate some of those defining characteristics, and you can kind of see them on screen in the slide that I have presented before you. Uh, uh, this focus on verisimilitude of everyday life, this depiction of non-stylized, non-idealized subject or setting, a certain sense of naturalism, for example, in the paintings of Corbet or the, the novels of Zola, a renouncing of idealism as prevalent uh, in classical medieval literature or romantic sentimentalism, kind of renouncing both idealism and sentimentalism, a focusing on mundane daily activities, a presentation of a secular moral frame, perhaps Flaubert's novel being one of the high points of this enterprise, an emphasis on the human element, a revelation of human sexuality and the dark recesses of psychology, for example, in the Dr. Wolski and Masterpieces, an exposition of the effects of the Industrial Revolution, the miserable condition of the workers, and the rise of the revolutionary firm. So with a constellation of such overlapping markers of realism, it is important for us to specify what we mean when we demarcate Flaubert's or Dostoevsky's novels as realist. Now, evidently, we can say that all these qualities are present in their fiction. And in a certain sense, we wouldn't be wrong. Yet it helps us to understand them better if we are more precise about the realism we discover in their work in the context of 19th century Europe. And uh, I think we have a launch pad out here in the term European. Note that contemporary conventions of canon formation have often contrasted the European and the English, and I don't mean merely uh, the European football and the English football league. Uh, rather, there is this uh, decided contrast that is often highlighted between continental and the British as if British culture has been bred by certain limitations of insularity. But such notions of insularity are misplaced, is often proven by continual interactions of continental novelists with the British ones. We know that Balzac, in many ways the literary model for Flaubert, was deeply influenced by Walter Scott's novels, and he had Byron as one of his early inspirations. Uh, Turgenev and Tolstoy, Dostoevsky's illustrious Russian contemporaries, both praised Dickens. Dostoevsky himself consciously imitated Dickens in many of his works. During his time in Siberia, he read the Pickwick Papers and David Copperfield and was deeply appreciative of Dickens's craft. Yet, there are ways in which the British novelistic tradition can be distinguished from the continental one. And I have Jan Watt's typology in mind that he presents in The Rise of the Novel. Watt points out um, how the traditions of British empiricism filtered through the philosophical investigations of John Locke, David Hume, and Thomas Reed overlapped with the Protestant ethic of the Reformation and the nascent bourgeois sense of the individual to engender the novelistic innovations of Defoe, Richardson, and Fiedley. Yet, the continental aesthetic description of realism, the term used for the first time in 1835 in the context of Rembrandt's painting, had a different source than the empiricist championing of salient individual observer and his, her understanding of the world. Now, because we are dealing with 19th century European novels, and by European, I'm kind of pointing out to this, stressing on this continental inflection, it is important to understand realism from this particular perspective. And this new inflection in the term realism is brought about by the Kantian revolution and its effect on continental thought. It is true that Immanuel Kant and his German idealist successors and rebels 
Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, Nietzsche, had considerable influence on English Romanticism and eventually its late 19th century morphing into modernist aesthetics. Yet in Europe, especially in Austria, Prussia, what later became Germany, France, and Russia, the tremors engendered by the philosophical consequences of Kant's thoughts were more comprehensive. Thus, when we are dealing with 19th century European novels in context of its realist inflections, it is paramount for us to understand Kant's Copernican shift. Now, it's very difficult to summarize Kant, but we would kind of stick to the basics. Uh, in the Critique of Pure Reason, published in 1781, Kant elaborates upon the limits of human rationality, and hence our perception of the quote-unquote real. For Kant, humans do not interact with the world through a stimuli-driven perception of objective truth out there. Rather, our perception of the world of objects is a perception of a world of phenomenal appearances, which are conditioned by a priori intuitive categories like space, time, causality. Thus, a world of matter is not perceived as it is, but only as how it has been shaped by the categories of perception. In other words, the objective salience of the real world as something separate from human cognition is questioned and problematized by Kant. But this unsettling of the empirical relationship of the subjective and objective world had consequences in the world of fiction. Human reason, which for Kant should be limited to the phenomenal world, runs up against antinomies or contradictions when it tries to delve in the realm of pure thought beyond the a priori categories. Thus, the questions about a realm beyond space and time, for example, or one which harmonizes causality with free will, are paradoxical ones because they lay bare the limits of human reason. For Kant, then, such experience of life's antinomies, its paradoxes, become an inherent part of the human experience. To bring about a mimetic representation of such a world riven by paradoxes was now a part of the feel of the real that realist fiction was meant to offer. So let's think of illustrative examples from the novels under discussion. Uh, for example, Dostoevsky. Uh, Dostoevsky uh, begins his novel with an elaboration on his protagonist's mental state. Raskolnikov is described as deep in debt and hence afraid of meeting his landlady. Uh, what follows, however, is a passage of remarkable Dostoevskyan exploration into the antinomies of human experience. Antinomies which make his world palpably paradoxical and quote unquote real to us. Now, I would quote from the text, and the text is on the slide on screen. He was hopelessly in debt to his landlady and was afraid of meeting her. This was not because he was cowardly and abject, quite the contrary. But for some time past, he had been in an overstrained, irritable condition, verging on hypochondria. He had become so completely absorbed in himself and so isolated from his fellows that he dreaded meeting not only his landlady, but anyone at all. He was crushed by poverty, but the anxieties of his position had of late ceased to weigh upon him. He had given up attending to matters of practical importance. He had lost all desire to do so. Nothing that any landlady could do had a real terror for him. But to be stopped on the stairs, to be forced to listen to her trivial, irrelevant gossip, to pestering demands for payment, threats and complaints, and to rack his brains for excuses, to prevaricate, to lie. No, rather than that, he would creep down the stairs like a cat and slip out unseen." Unquote. I would want you to note that the passage starts with an assertion that Raskolnikov was not cowardly and abject. 
conceded by an assertion that he was afraid of meeting his landlady. The passage ends with describing Raskolnikov's preference for creeping down the stairs like a cat and slip out unseen. The stealthy, surreptitious action of a man who is evidently afraid and sheepish. Now, is Raskolnikov cowardly or is he not? As readers, we relish this antinomy as our own. And isn't this very description at the heart of the novel's realistic ambience? Raskolnikov's mental state is described in terms of an irresoluble paradox. Let's take another example from, um, from Flaubert, from Madame Bovary. Uh, by the end of part one, chapter five, Emma had uh, gradually realized that perhaps she is not in love with her husband, Charles. Yet her irresolution about love has deeper sources of ambiguity. As the following chapter describes in considerable details, Emma's idea about love has been formed by her reading of books, of fiction, of novels. In other words, they are themselves nebulous and fictive. What do such nebulous notions tell us about her state of mind? Let's read Flaubert. And uh, I have the quote on screen. Before her marriage, she had believed that she was in love. But since the happiness she had expected this love to bring her had not come, she supposed she must have been mistaken. And Emma tried to find out what exactly was meant in real life by the words bliss, passion, and ecstasy, words that she had found so beautiful in books." Unquote. This ending of part one, chapter five, uh, provides us with one of such states of irresolution which have drawn generations of readers to Flaubert's novel. Why? Because this irresolution conveys a sense of real experiences and feelings as we come across them in our experience of the phenomenal world. Now, it's not that the genre of novel writing merely relishes in delving in antinomies. Rather, these antinomies are often conjectured to define larger structural characteristics of the novel. Jorge Lukács in The Theory of the Novel discusses about the historical conditions that gave rise to the novel. Uh, I have the quote on, on screen uh, for you to read. Um, in the age of the novel, the once known unity between the man and, the, and his world, between the subjective and objective spheres of existence, has been lost. And the hero has become an estranged seeker of meaning of existence. But this estrangement is, however, what gives the novel its formal distinctiveness. It kind of posits a crisis. And yet this crisis, according to Lukács, leads to a successful dialectical contradiction. And when Lukács uses the term dialectical contradiction, he kind of borrows it from Hegel and his idea of contradiction, uh, his idea of contraries and the sublation of the contraries. So Lukács claims that the crisis in realist novels leads to a successful dialectical contradiction and eventually a sublation into a higher domain of synthesized reality. It is this reality that the novel as a form approaches and which Dostoevsky's novels, according to Lukács, eventually embody. Being a young Hegelian in 1914-15 when he wrote this essay, Lukács finds in Dostoevsky uh, not only Kantian antinomies, antinomies, but Hegelian sublation. And he states, and I quote, and you would have the quote as a second extract on your screen. It is in the words of Dostoevsky that this new world, remote from any struggle against what actually exists, 
is drawn for the first time simply as a seen reality. This is why he and the form he created lie outside the scope of this book. Dostoevsky did not write novels, unquote. But this will sound epigrammatic, but later in life, Lukács kind of would not deny Dostoevsky the position amongst the great novelists. Rather, he would find in all great novels, all great realist novels, the potency of sublating the dialectical contradictions of subjective life and objective world, as he had initially found only in Dostoevsky's works. For later Lukács, it is this potency in novels which defies reification and sets them up as texts of resistance. Now, in his very famous book, History and Class Consciousness, published in 1923, Lukács gives particular currency to this Marxist term, reification. Now, uh, I wouldn't go into kind of quoting Lukács. I would kind of, we would try to discuss reification um, through simple uh, enunciation. For our purposes, uh, we note that reification is a false assignation of human properties, actions, and relations to things produced by human beings. Thus giving these, that is those objects, a mistaken salience in the commodity world as objects of fetish. So qualities that would belong to individuals, humans, would now be adduced to these objects. The Marxists, like Lukács, have critiqued such false assignations brought about by what they claim to be bourgeois ideology, because this is a phenomenon that, according to them, leads to human alienation from objects of labor and mis misrecognition of the class position of the subject or producer, hence delaying the dawn of revolutionary class consciousness. It is interesting to note that Lukács, for Lukács, the ideological orientation of great novelists like Balzac or Tolstoy is immaterial, as long as they remain true to the realist conventions, or what he defined as the realist conventions of the novelistic form. We know that Balzac was a royalist and Tolstoy a landed aristocrat, Dostoevsky a schizoid epileptic mystic, Gogol a czarist, Flaubert an inveterate liberal. Yet the realist tradition upheld, according to Lukács, a revolutionary process uh, which liberates because it connects the parts of disparate subject-object reality into a, a Hegelian sublated totality. In the essay, Realism and the Balance, and I have a quote from that essay as a, uh, as a second extract on your screen, uh, this was published in 1938. Lukács celebrates this and counterpoints it to the rising tide of what he called anti-realist modernist fiction. Lukács declares, and I quote him, only when the masterpieces of realism past and present are appreciated as wholes will their topical, cultural, and political value fully emerge. This value resides in their inexhaustible diversity, in contrast to the one dimensionality of modernism. The large scale enduring resonance of great works of realism is in fact due to this accessibility, to the infinite multitude of doors through which entry is possible. The wealth of the characterization, the profound and accurate grasp of constant and typical manifestations of human life is what produces the great progressive reverberation of these works." Unquote. Lukács persistently critiques the modernist novel and its practitioners, Joyce, Kafka, Beckett, Wolf, because according to him, these works, that is the modernist works, in contrast to the realist works, misrecognize a particular condition of modern bourgeois world, the condition of alienation, to be universal in scope and hence inescapable. 
He sees this tendency as an upshot of the bourgeois regressive fear of the revolution in the post-1848 scenario. For him, the modernist writer lacks critical de detachment from the malaise of his times, while the realist can gain this distance through the multidimensionality of his or her work. Now, it is interesting to kind of consider the realism in the novels under discussion from Lukács' viewpoint. And Rostovsky's crime and punishment, as we all know, uh, contains within itself various marks of fragmentation and disillusionment of not only the central protagonist, but various voices of dissonance, which talks acts against the status quo. Uh, Dostoevsky's novel is aware of the great divide which existed in pre-emancipation Russia, that is, before 1861. The small coterie of aristocrats and landowners who lorded over vast populations of landless serfs, who lived in abysmal conditions in a tightly knit, largely rural feudal structure. After the publication of his first novel, Poor Folk, uh, in 1845, uh, which was kind of branded as the first Russian social novel, Dostoevsky was drawn into the utopian socialist Petrushevsky circle, which opposed serfdom and Tsarist excesses. His associations eventually landed him up in front of the firing squad. And although his life was spared, he landed up eventually imprisoned in Siberia uh, from 1849 to 1854. Dostoevsky's great Russian contemporaries and predecessors, Gogol, Turgenev, Tolstoy, dealt with the same socio-political reality in their novels. Gogol, for example, in Dead Souls, published in 1842, depicted haunting images of serfdom. Turgenev's Fathers and Sons, uh, 1862, and Virgin Soil, which was published in 1877, depict the clash of generations between an earlier generation of idealist aristocrats and a later generation of um, cynical subversives like Bazarov, for example, in Fathers and Sons, or Nezdanov in Virgin Soil. Tolstoy's War and Peace, published in 1869, was an epic elaboration of the changes uh, catapulted in Russia by the Napoleonic invasion. Well, his Anna Karenina, 1878, depicts an extramarital love affair, much like uh, Flaubert's Mother Bovary, in the backdrop of reforms ushered in by Alexander II. Now, in his later years, Dostoevsky distanced himself from socialist activism, especially from its militant and nihilist inflections. His major works of later years, Crime and Punishment, The Idiot, published in 1869, Demons, uh, published in 1871, 72, and The Brothers, Karamazov, 1879-1880, all presented nihilist, atheist, revolutionary ideas as counterpoints to a certain mystical enunciation of Orthodox Christianity, which is ultimately vindicated by the plot. Yet, such oversimplification of Dostoevsky's plots rarely does justice to the power of his novels. It is true that in Demons, for example, the destructive revolutionary efforts of Peter Verkhovensky is critiqued, or even Karan Mozov's cynicism about the redemptive potency of Christ, brilliantly described in the Grand Inquisitor section of the Brothers Karmazov, is addressed and countered later by the mysticism of Elder Yoshima. In Crime and Punishment, uh, both Razumhin and Raskolnikov represent divergent ideations of the subversive voices prevalent in the Russian university circles. Their denunciation of Luzine in part two, chapter five, brings out their distaste for bourgeois snobbery and prudery. In fact, Raskolnikov's article on crime, which was published in an obscure magazine, and this is discussed in part three, chapter five, it becomes one of the chief reasons why he's suspected by Porphyry. And why does Porphyry suspect him? because the article represents his disregard for conventional morality and upholds, uh, champions, the Napoleonic man, uh, a, a ubermatch, a superman of sorts, who transforms society through an utter disregard and transgression of its existing laws and practices. 
Later, obviously, in part five, chapter one, Dostoevsky presents a caricature of socialist nihilist iconoclasm in the character of Lev Zyatnikov. Yet, it's not because these subversive notes are sounded that the novel gains potency, as Lukács would argue, as a voice of resistance. Rather, for Lukács, a truly realistic novel, a truly realist novel never fails to depict the true relation of the subjective voice of disgruntlement in characters like Raskolnikov and the objective world that they inhabit through an intricate network of multi-layered assertions which propels these contraries to a higher, sublated, and for Lukács, a revolutionary reality. Now, let's take concrete examples. Um, for example, the pathos engendered by the depiction of Marmeladov's accidental death and the eventual suffering of Katerina Ivanovna and her children is not merely a moral injunction against alcoholism or Katerina's aristocratic pretensions. Rather, in Katerina's rant against the idea of Christian redemption suggested by the priest, is her disgruntlement against the cruel, stifling, hierarchic system of contemporary Russia, an unjust system which caused misery to millions and which was in turn defended through a fatalist view of Christian providence. Let's look at the passage. And the passage is uh, the first excerpt on your screen. What am I to do with these? She interrupted sharply and irritably, pointing to the little ones. God is merciful. Look to the Most High for succor, the priest began. Ah, he is merciful, but not to us. That's a sin, a sin, madam, observed the priest, shaking his head. And isn't that a sin? cried Katerina Ivanovna, pointing to the dying man. But Rostovsky keeps the notes of dissidence in the scene in that. Though he emphasizes the importance of prayer and Christian redemption in other parts of the novel. One is reminded of, for example, part five, chapter four, in which Raskolnikov finally reveals himself as a murderer to Sonia. Sonia emphatically declares her love for Raskolnikov, uh, even after the revelation, and vouches that she would never leave him and urges that he must suffer for love, for Christian love. In fact, they both have to suffer to bear the crosses together, as she kind of words it. Yet this self-effacing espousal of Christianity remains in cohabitation with Katerina's cynicism in Dostoevsky's text. Even at the very end of the novel, Dostoevsky keeps his novelistic vision of the world perilously suspended in between the contraries of faith and skepticism. Raskolnikov, Several years imprisoned in Siberia is still unvisited by the final redemption, which Dostoevsky promises would be, and I quote, a new story. Yet, when Lukács suggests a sublation as the final result of novel surrealist vision, Dostoevsky leaves us with only vague hints of reconciliation with, and I quote, hitherto completely unknown reality. Here I'm quoting from PVR. Volkonsky translation, the Constance Garnet translation for these words is a new unknown life. Now, this vision of this unknown reality, this unknown life, is still in suspension by the end of the novel. And Dostoevsky delineates, and I quote, this is the second extract on your screen. This is from the second chapter of the epilogue. Under his pillow lay the New Testament. He took it up mechanically. The book belonged to Sonia. It was the one from which she had read the raising of Lazarus to him. Till now, he had not opened it. He didn't open it now, but one thought passed through his mind. Can her convictions not be mine now? Her feelings, her aspirations at least? Unquote. Now, Mikhail Bakhtin, the famed Russian critic, 
notes that this melange of multiple voices in what he terms as Dostoevsky's polyphonic novel. And this is from uh, Bakhtin's early work on Dostoevsky, Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics, the name of the book. And I have the quote on screen. Uh, he states, any acquaintance with the voluminous literature on Dostoevsky leaves the impression that one is dealing not with a single author or artist who wrote novels and stories, but with a number of philosophical statements by several author thinkers, Raskolnikov, Mishkin, Stavrogin, Ivan Karamazov, the Grand Inquisitor, and others. For the purposes of critical thought, Dostoevsky's work has been broken down into a series of disparate, contradictory philosophical stances, each defended by one or another character. Among these also figure, but in far from first place, the philosophical views of the author himself. For some scholars, Dostoevsky's voice merges with the voices of one or another of his characters. For others, it is a peculiar synthesis of all these ideological voices. For yet others, Dostoevsky's voice is simply drowned out by all those other voices." Unquote. Now, in this early piece of uh, literary criticism, uh, Bakhtin argues that Dostoevsky's works are essentially dialogical, he uses this term dialogical, to suggest a weaving in a weaving in an interaction between autonomous voices. And he opposes this to monological, where plot and character unfold within the confines of a single authorial universe. Moreover, the hero's subjectivity and self-consciousness becomes the basis of this exposition, so that even the narratorial functions of the author are transferred to the consciousness of his characters, especially the hero. This foregrounding of hero's subjectivity entails that in Dostoevsky, the hero's discourse about himself is merged with his ideological discourse about the world. Now, in a character of the monological type, an idea becomes a mere aspect of reality. In contrast, for Dostoevsky, the idea doesn't reside within a person's head. It is a live, real event played out in the realm of intersubjectivity. It is important to note that in Bakhtin's later writings, he would highlight that this dialogism is an important characteristic of novel as a genre. With obviously Dostoevsky's works being a remarkable example of this wider, more pervasive phenomenon. His view on Dostoevsky helps us to comprehend how Dostoevsky's realism resists all sorts of finalization, external finalization, into stable, neutral images. But the realism encountered in Flaubert's Madame Bovary is interesting in other ways. We know that Flaubert was a great and conscious stylist, and his novel about marital infidelity has a consciously shaped tripartite structure, much like classical symphony. Flaubert's predecessors, Dandal and Balzac, among others, had contributed to the development of this intricate structure. In the works of all these three great mid-19th century French novelists, we witness an interest in dealing with the historical transformation of the French society in the post-revolutionary times through the lens of interpersonal relationships. For example, the onset of the Bourbon Restoration becomes the launch pad for both Stardal's The Red and the Black, published in 1839, and Balzac's novels of the La Comédie Humaine cycle, especially his masterpieces, Eugene Grade and La Père Gorio, uh, published in 1835. Eugene Grade was published in 1933. And here, it wouldn't be inconsequent to note that Dostoevsky started his literary career by translating Eugene Grade uh, in Russian. 1843. 
not only do many of these narratives elaborate on marital infidelity and subsequent unhappiness, they do so with a certain understanding of the connection between the failure of interpersonal relationships and the tumultuous course of French history, if not European history, from the French Revolution to Napoleonic tyrannical empire to the restoration of the Bourbon uh, dynasty and eventually to the July uprising of 1830 and the ascension of Louis Philippe uh, to the French throne. And it looks forward prophetically to uh, the tumults of 1848 and uh, the eventual framing of the Republic under Napoleon III in 1852. Uh, in fact, the subtitle to Stardal's uh, The Red and the Black is a chronicle of the 19th century. Now, this subtitle associates the adventures of the social climber, like Julian Sorel, depicted in the novel, with the tension between old Bourbon aristocrats and new Napoleonic bourgeoisie. Similarly, for example, Felix Grabe's wealth in Eugene Grabe's uh, novel could be gained only because of the confiscation of church lands by the French Republic. Now, like Sorel in Stendhal's novel or Rastignac in Balzac Le Père Gorio, Emma also dreams of an ideal life of a bourgeois which a provincial setting hardly affords her. The subtitle uh, to Flaubert's novel, highlighting it as a study of provincial manners, directs the readers to notions of this bit of socio-historical realism. Now, the utter provinciality of Normandy countryside, depicted in the novel, is contrasted with the cosmopolitan life of Rouen, and Paris, its spectral image. Tote, the obscure village, and Yonville, the provincial town, are portrayed as places where the winds of change propelled by the French Revolution have not yet reached. For Balzac, writing in a post-1848 world, it was important to stress the limitations of revolutionary transformation. The petit bourgeois life of Charles Bovary, the country doctor, and the pharmacist, Moshe Homé, not to mention the merchant, Moshe Leroux, uh, are deeply entrenched in the chronotope of an older feudal society. Yet, Charles has an understanding of reality in terms of family, social respectability, and profit, which is distinctly bourgeois, ideations which sustain his affiliation with uneventful mediocrity. He rarely questions himself and sees his relationship with Emma, as well as his past relationship with his deceased wife, his first wife, as reified relationship with objects. I quote Flaubert, and this is uh, the first quote on your screen. This is from part one, chapter five. Then for 14 months, he had lived with a widow whose feet in bed were like blocks of ice. But now he possessed for always this pretty woman whom he adored. The universe for him was bound by the silken circle of a petticoat. He couldn't resist constantly touching her comb, her rings, her scarf, unquote. Is this lack of connect with beings and their continual reification in objects, which unsettles the reader when he comes to terms with Flaubert's horrifying vision of vacuity in human lives. This reification of relationships and ideas into objects is not only typical of Charles. Emma's dream of passion and love, infested with oaken chests and guard rooms and white plumed velvet hats, etc., etc. The green silk cigar case, for example, a memento from the ball at Marquis's chateau carried with it, and this accidental memento carried with it, uh, markedly fetish-like associations. And I quote Flaubert. This is the second quote on your screen. She would look at it, open it, and even sniff its lining, which smelled of verbena and tobacco. Whose was it? The Vicomte's. Perhaps it was a gift from his mistress. She had embroidered it on some rosewood frame, 
Sighs of love had passed through the meshes of the canvas, and every thrust of the needle had stitched a hope or a memory into them. All those intertwined threads of silk were simply the continuing expression of the same silent passion. And then, one morning, the Vikut had taken it away with him. What had they talked about while it was lying on one of those broad mantelpieces between the vases of flowers and pompadour clocks? She was in Tote, whereas he now was in Paris, far away. What kind of place was it, this Paris? What an immeasurable name. Again and again, she would repeat it under her breath, delighting in the sound. It echoed in her ears like a great cathedral bell. It blazed before her eyes, even on the labels of her jars of pomade. Unquote. Now, the realism of this vast association of central data uh, offers the readers uh, a kind of fascinating and yet unnerving experience. Like Emma, we are taken in by the sheer richness of the images, the scenes, the oral resonances, only to realize much later that these associations with passions reified as objects are bound to disappoint us eventually. Now, think of, for example, the experience of disappointment in the novel. It kind of charts this eventual dis dissatisfaction with reification. Think of Rudolf Boulanger and Leon. Both realize it uh, as they gradually distance themselves from Emma. Rudolf, for example, notes it especially when reflecting on his change of heart about Emma. And I quote, uh, this is the first quote on your screen. He had heard these things said to him so many times that they no longer held surprises for him. Emma was just like all his mistresses, and the charm of novelty gradually fading away like a garment laid bare in the monotony of passion, which never varies in its forms and expressions. Unquote. Emma and Leon both realize a similar lapse in passion as their love trysts at the hotel in Rouen become habitual meetings. And I quote from the sixth chapter of the third part. This is the second quote on your screen. Increasingly, they were reduced to talking about matters extraneous to their love. And the letters that Emma wrote to him were full of flowers and poetry, the moon and the stars, naive stimulants for a flagging passion that sought nourishment from any and every external source. She continually promised herself that her next trip would bring her profound bliss. And then afterwards, she had to admit that she had felt nothing extraordinary. In that brow pearled with cold sweat, in those stammering lips and unfocused eyes, in those gripping arms, there seemed to Leon to be something excessive, shadowy and ominous, something that kept slipping between them subtly to separate them." Unquote. It is here that Flaubert kind of traps his readers in a double bind. Like Emma, conceived of love by reading novels and fetishizing passion, the readers have come to know about the events described in Flaubert's narrative through the reception of similar visual, olfactory, and oral data processed through language. If the vacuity of one is tragically professed at the end of the novel, what sustains the reality of the other? As Emma's arsenic-stained body horrifies us, as disillusionment devastates Charles, and he dies clinging to a fetish, Emma's lock of air, we are compelled to ask questions about the inner vacuity, not only of the passions depicted by Flaubert, but about passions in our real lives. How real are our passions? And how real are we as subjects of these feelings? Now, that the vivid, realistic depictions, uh, the descriptions which make or characterize this novelist realist and many others, that these vivid, realistic descriptions could lead to unsettling suggestions about emptiness of the subject, troubled Lukács. 
And he notes that elaborate descriptions can be ominous presagement of the transcendent nothingness. This is the term that he uses, transcendent nothingness, that for him lies at the heart of Flaubert's successors, uh, the modernist novels. Lucas, Lukács states, and I quote him, uh, this is the first quote on your screen, in isolation, descriptive detail may be genuine enough reflection of reality. But whether or not the sequence and organization make for an adequate image of objective reality will depend on the writer's attitude towards reality as a whole. For this attitude determines the function which the individual detail is accorded in the context of the whole." Unquote. The Flaubert's devastating revelation about the transcendent nothingness of the subject evidently disturbs Lukács as it disrupts his cherished envisioning of the whole or the Hegelian totality as the desired objective of realism and fiction. Yet other literary critics, like for example Theodore Adorno, would have a very different understanding of this apparent superfluity of descriptive detail in realist writing and modernist writing. And this stylistic emphasis on form in Flaubert and his modernist successors, Joyce, Kafka, and Beckett. Adorno points out the limitation of Lukács' analogical association of consciousness and reality to art, as if the subjective objective dialectic in the world and in art are the same. This is something that Adorno kind of protests against, this identification of the subjective objective duality in the real world and the subjective objective real duality in a, a, a piece like a novel, in a work of art. Adorno negates this identification and he vouches for art's salience. And I would read to you, um, a, a, an excerpt from a writing that he wrote as a reaction to Lukács' uh, essay. Um, this is a second quote on screen. Art exists within reality, has its function in it, and is also inherently mediated with reality in many ways. But nevertheless, as art, by its very concept, it stands in an antithetical relationship to the status quo. Even Lukács will hardly be able to get around the fact that the content of works of art is not real in the same sense as social reality. The difference between empirical existence and art concerns the intrinsic structure of the latter. In art, even what Lukács considers to be solipsism, and a regression to the illusionary immediacy of the subject doesn't signify a denial of the object, but rather aims dialectically at reconciliation with the object. The object is taken into the subject in the form of an image, rather than turning to stone in front of it, like an object under the spell of the alienated world. Through the contradiction between the object that has been reconciled within an image, that is spontaneously assimilated into the subject and the real unreconciled object out there in the world, the work of art criticizes reality. It represents negative knowledge of reality. Unquote. The reconciliation that Adorno sought in literature or arts, dialectical tryst with the real world is mediated through its salient form. Thus for Adorno, it is a conscious emphasis on the formal qualities of literature that would spur its negative dialectics with the unreconciled world of objects. Even an apparently realist novel like Flaubert's Madame Bovary sustains its realism through its formal constitution as a piece of linguistic signification. It is this emphasis that relates its parts into a formal unity, not through an assertion 
of tyrannical dominance of totality, of a Hegelian totality or a whole, but through its continual dialectic interplay in the intersubjective realms. Thank you. I would end here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Dr. Sengupta, <clears throat> uh, for this hour long uh, disquisition on realism and uh, real realistic tendencies in both Russian fiction and uh, French fiction, 19th century Russian and French fiction. Uh, <clears throat> it was a very enlightening session. And uh, moreover, the panoramic score, the panoramic scope of your uh, discussion, on the beginning from uh, <clears throat> kind of giving us a, a giving us an insight into the term realism, how the term realism has developed over the centuries in both European and in English. Uh, and after that, uh, you hold forth for the next one hour about <clears throat> the way realism has been interpreted in both Russian and also in French fiction, giving examples from such masters like George Dukas, uh, sorry, uh, quoting from him. Uh, I will now uh, lay the floor open uh, for the audience. If the audience has anything to ask, if there are any queries, if there are any observations, if there are any point that they want to make, <clears throat> I lay the floor open to the audience. Uh, if there's anything forthcoming from the audience, you can either put it on the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask. Anyone from the audience, uh, any member of the audience, any Rungit, observation? I, I, I have something to tell. Rungit, uh, am I audible? You are. Yeah, you are. OK. Rungit, you mentioned Baljak's <coughs> The Human Comedy. It was written in 1842, right? And Balzac said that there is a uh, inherent relation between the scientific methods and the poetic methods. So the precision of the scientific methods uh, are actually incorporated in the realist novels. In Flaubert's case, we have seen that he has very uh, methodically, very minutely gave us details about scientific experiments like the setting up of club foods. Yes. So uh, can you uh, shed some light on it? Uh, the scientific precision uh, uh, where realism uh, uh, where is connected uh, exactly. with poetry. And another thing that is in Flaubert case, Flaubert uh, has not only uh, used realist techniques or used realism in his novel, but also satirizes emotionalism and romanticism. Uh, can you shed some light on it? Thank you. Yeah, that's the question, Omrita. Uh, uh, well, this this particular tendency uh, of uh, a kind of realist, uh, a kind of scientific precision in art, a supposedly scientific precision in art, is something that you uh, can note not only in Flaubert and uh, and Balzac, but also in Zola, for example. So you have a kind of line, a kind of line developing in uh, French literature, focusing on an integration of um, scientific observations in novelistic writing. Now, this, uh, I guess, has um, two important impulses. One, uh, the, the, the sphere of novelistic writing was continuously um, challenged, if you might say, from 18th century onwards, with um, with with uh, accusations of being imprecise, especially when it was contrasted with, uh, say, writings from in non-fictional quarters by scientists, anthropologists, geologists, etc., etc. And this becomes prominent in the academy circles, both in France and in England. So being precise, uh, as far as the scientific descriptions 
um, are the, the, as far as integrating scientific descriptions in the novels becomes a way of answering or catering to these acquisitions that have been laid on fiction. Secondly, uh, there is a peculiar way in which Balzac and Zola, uh, because Balzac and Zola, as you know, would enter into writing cycles of novels. So in a certain kind of way, and Zola's cycle was influenced by Balzac's. So uh, when they would enter into writing these cycles, they would try to associate uh, the written word, the depiction of uh, clustered by the written signifiers uh, with processes that are observable in the scientific world. Mm -hmm. You know that in Zola, this would be kind of carried out to an obsessive excess, where Zola would kind of uh, delineate the characters of his long novel cycle and associate their characters with uh, kind of genetic <coughs> from their predecessors. And this idea of uh, qualities passing through genes uh, would kind of uh, emphasize for him the veracity of the world that he depicts in his novels. So I guess uh, uh, the depiction of scientific precision in the traditions of naturalism was uh, kind of brought in by two different impulses, but connected impulses. On one hand, this was uh, an answering uh, to the accusations that were laid on to kind of lose novel writing, imprecise writing or imaginative writing, a certain uh, challenge that was often laid on romantic fiction, for example. And this is precisely why you would have those satirical takes on romanticism in Flaubert and uh, Zola, because uh, the romantic writings were being critiqued for being imprecise and sentimentalized. And this is being critiqued. So this is the first impulse. But the second, more formal impulse would be to associate the elucidation of novel as a as a linguistic uh, process akin to the processes of the scientific world. And here you have this obsession with human nature and its depiction through scientific precise language. For example, even in Dostoevsky's novel, Crime and Punishment, you have uh, continual discussions about the nature of uh, Raskolnikov's um, problem. Uh, discussed by characters in the novel itself. Uh, so this is, I guess, the impulse uh, that framed this drive towards scientific, scientifically precise prose. Thank you for your elucidation, Rungit. Well, <clears throat> anyone else with uh, any queries? Um. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, anyone? Sir, apni kante ropore je slide ta dekhishen ota ropore arak bar kono bolben. Slide. Sir, mute hoye ase. Kante ropore slide ta. Ami tarbe ki slide ta share korbo. To talar bhutte shubida hobe. Ek minute daro. Let me share the slide. Um. Wait a sec. Huh. Uh, this is like, as I told, je, uh, ke bol chilam, de, ke bol chhi, je, can't ke kind of summarize kora, amader ei particular talker uh, purview te oshambhav. In the a particular idea grohun korte chishta kora chhi, can't ke teke jeta tumra jano, there is one of the uh, defining uh, paradig paradigmatic shifts in Kant's uh, philosophical endeavors. Now, in his critique of pure reason, Kant elaborates upon the limits of human rationality and hence our perception of the real. Kant is a real world that is real world that is perceived in the real world. So, this perception is 
কেবল মাত্র এম্পেরিসিস ট্রেডিশন যেরকম ভাবে দেখেছে অর্থাৎ কিনা লক যেরকম ভাবে দেখেছেন বা অ্যাডম রিড যেরকম ভাবে দেখছেন সেরকম ভাবে দেখলে হবে না বিকজ এম্পেরিসিস ট্রেডিশন কেবল এই পারসেপশনটাকে একটা স্টিমুলি ড্রিভেন মেকানিস্টিক প্রসেস হিসেবে দেখতে চেষ্টা করেছিল কান্ট এই প্রসেসটির বিরোধিতা করছেন উনি বলছেন যে আমরা যখন পারসিভ করছি মানে দ্য থিং আউট দেয়ার যেটা আমাদের পৃথিবী সেটাকে আমরা পারসিভ করছি সেটাকে আমরা পারসিভ করছি থ্রু আ সার্টেন কাইন্ড অফ লেন্স এরকমভাবে চিন্তা করতে পারো যে আমরা যেন একটা একটা চশমা পড়ে আছি যে চশমাটাকে দিয়ে আমরা পারসিভ করছি ফেনোমেনাল রিয়ালিটিকে এবং এই চশমাটা ইস ফ্রেমড বাই ক্যাটাগরি দ্যাট আর প্রিসেট যেটাকে উনি বলছেন অ প্রায়োরি ক্যাটাগরিস ক্যাটাগরিস লাইক স্পেস টাইম কজালিটি এবং এই ক্যাটাগরিগুলি ছাড়া কিন্তু আমরা রিয়ালিটিকে পারসিভ করতে পারছি না তার মানে কারণ বলছেন যে আমাদের রিজন আমাদের র্যাশনালিটির একটা লিমিট রয়েছে বিশেষ করে আমরা যখন ওয়ার্ল্ডটাকে পারসিভ করছি তখন আমরা পারসিভ করছি এই লিমিট গুলোর ভেতর দিয়ে এই ক্যাটাগরি গুলোর ভেতর দিয়ে এবং সেহেতু যেটাকে আমরা পারসিভ করছি সেটা ইজ নট আ ওয়ার্ল্ড আউট দেয়ার অর্থাৎ কিনা ইট ইজ নট মেয়ারলি অ্যান অবজেক্টিভ রিয়ালিটি কান্টের কারণ যে শব্দটা ব্যবহার করছেন ইট ইজ আ ফেনোমেনাল রিয়ালিটি ইট ইজ আ ফেনোমেনাল রিয়ালিটি বিকজ ইট ইজ শেপড বাই দিজ ক্যাটাগরিস দ্যাট আলোচনা Uh, anyone else with anything else uh, anyone else with any queries anything that you need uh, uh, to be elucidated by dr shen gupta you can write in the chat box also if you uh, want to sir <coughs> last sign ta jeta dekhiyechilen theodor adorno oi ta ektu arek bar bolben আলোচনা করিনি আমরা পার্টিকুলার একটা ডোনোর conceptualization of what art is and its relationship with reality is seta amra alochona korte chesta korechi basically i don't know ei point ta ke bujhte gele bujhte hobe i don't know what is i don't know trying to defend and what is lukacs critiquing lukacs ki critique korchen lukacs critique korchen certain what he perceives to be anti realist strands in fiction now this these anti realist strands are strands that he notes in uh, modernist writing of joyce of kafka of uh, beckett etc etc but he traces these strands back to certain 19th century precursors and flaubert uh, being one such precursor lukacs jeta bolchen je e jokhon একটা প্লেথরা অফ ডিটেলস অফার করা হচ্ছে রিয়েলিস্ট ফিকশন কে আমরা রিয়েলিস্ট মনে রিয়েল মনে করছি কেন কারণ ইট অফার্স আ প্লেথরা অফ ডিটেলস তাই না কি এবং এই কোয়ালিটি অফ দ্য রিয়েলিস্ট ফিকশন কিন্তু কন্টিনিউস কোয়াইট ইন্টারেস্টিংলি ইভেন ইন মডার্নিস্ট লিটারেচার থিঙ্ক অ্যাবাউট ফর এক্সাম্পল জয়সেস ইউলিসিস রাইট থিঙ্ক অ্যাবাউট হাউ মানে এক্সহস্টিভলি হি ডিসক্রাইবস ডাবলিন দ্যাট ওয়ান ডে ইন ডাবলিন রাইট লুকাচ ক্রিটিক করছেন উনি বলছেন যে যখন রিয়েলিস্ট ফিকশনের ভেতরে এবং মডার্নিস্ট ফিকশনের ভেতরে সার্টেন কাইন্ডস অফ রিয়েলিস্ট ফিকশন যেগুলো কিনা ডিভিয়েট করে যাচ্ছে ফ্রম ইটস নর্ম সেই টাইপের রিয়েলিস্ট ফিকশনের ভেতরে এবং মডার্নিস্ট সাকসেসের ভেতরে এই প্লেথর অফ ডিটেলসকে অফার করা হয় আমাদের 
তখন দিস নিডস টু বি মডিউলেটেড বাই অ্যান আইডিয়া অফ দ্য হোল অর্থাৎ কি না যখন ডিটেলস গুলো অফার করা হবে তখন ইট শুড নট বি কিওটিক পারপাসলেস ফ্লিঙ্গিং অফ ডিটেলস ইট শুড বি informed by its place in the larger whole the larger schema of things and this is important for lukach because lukach er kache each individual details and the contraries that may arise from those details are eventually sublated through a higher synthesis that the novel should bring about এই হায়ার সিনথেসিস এর আইডিয়াটাই লুকাচ ট্রেস করছেন ইন হেগেলিয়ান মার্কসিস্ট লিটারেচার অ্যাডোর্নো অন দি আদার হ্যান্ড পয়েন্টস আউট টু দ্য ফ্যাক্ট যে লুকাচের এই আইডিয়া अबाउट অ্যাপ্রোচিং দ্য হোল দিস অবসেশন উইথ দ্য হোল ইজ মিসপ্লেসড অ্যাডোর্নোর কাছে এই অবসেশন ফর অ্যাচিভিং আ হেগেলিয়ান সিনথেসিস ইজ a dangerously totalizing uh, uh, process ebon tumra jano je actual perspective ta ki it's uh, it derives from adorno's anti fascist and anti stalinist critiques um lukach tumra jano je live behind the iron curtain adorno travel to us so uh, their conflict a particular bapare conflict is also politically inflected এইগুলো যে কোন হায়ার হোল অ্যাচিভ করছে না বলে লুকাচ মনে করছেন সেখানে লুকাচের এক্সপেকটেশন অফ অ্যাচিভিং হায়ার সিনথেসিস ইস অ্যাকর্ডিং টু এডোন মিসপ্লেসড এডোন মনে করছেন যে ওয়ার্ক অফ আর্ট কে রিয়েল ওয়ার্ল্ড এর সাথে আইডেন্টিফাই করলে চলবে না উনি মনে করছেন কোথা থেকে আসছে উনি বলছেন যে দেখো যে একটা ওয়ার্ক অফ আর্ট এর ভেতরে একটা সাবজেক্ট অবজেক্ট যেরকম for example jodi chobi ako tale it is shaped by color and form and lines jodi tumi kobita lekho ba uponash lekho it is shaped by words and sentences and paragraphs etc etc is a formal constituent eta for adorno is important adorno bolchen it is this formal constituent that continuously reminds us that the work of art is not life that the work of art has a salient existence of its own in a work of art you create oni bolchen ekta image er kotha je object gulo object world ta ke ekta image hishebe grohon kora hoy in the consciousness of the of the protagonist of the characters uh ekhane You, you may be reminded of the discussion that Bakhtin has about uh, Dostoevsky. So, AJ work of AJ object ta kekta image hi chabhe grohon kora holo in the consciousness ebong shekhane jana otta reconciliation ni asha holo a reconciliation ta kintu is only there in the work of art and this reconciliation is achieved only because the work of art uses certain formal elements. Adorno says that by placing this reconciliation in the work of art side by side with the unreconciled object in the world by placing these two side by side you achieve an understanding of the world through negative 
dialectics. This is the term that Adorno uses. Why is he using this term negative dialectics? Hegel mone korchen je ekta positive sublation hobe into a higher reality. This is oh, something that Adorno suspects. Ebang shei jonno he suspects Lukács. Ebang shei jonno hi uni mone korchen je a it is only through a kind of negation that the work of art helps us to identify the world. It is not through identification, and it is hence the formal elements in the work of art that is of primal importance. Is it clear? Uh, is it clear, Priyanka? Yes, sir. I think, I think Priyanka was the question. Thank okay. You. Okay. Uh, Shuddhishna has a uh, question. She has put it in the chat box. Uh, can you read it? Uh, let me read. Let me read it for you. Sir Bolchilam, realism, what role plays in the problems of Dostoevsky's poetics? I think she's asking uh, what is the role of realism in the poetics of Dostoevsky? I think maybe she wants uh, you to uh, dwell on the antinomies, on the contraries that we find in Dostoevsky, the Christian piety coexisting with uh, the grimness. Maybe that is what uh, she wants to be elucidated. <coughs> Yeah, uh, so Shudrishna, uh, Shudrishna, that uh, whole uh, the problems of Dostoevsky's poetics, uh, in fact, that's the name of the Bhakti book that I quoted from, right? Uh, problems Bulchen Kano, Bhakti Nitaka problem Kishabe point out Hutchen Kano, Bhakti Nitaka problem Kishabe Dikchen, a Karun. The matter of fact understanding of reality as we had encountered in the empiricist tradition was that the human understanding or the human con consciousness uh, has a salient existence in the world and it perceives a world out there. The world out there is made of matter. Even human consciousness stands as a salient and often a reliable observer of the world out there. Dostoevsky's poetics are bhetore bhaktin problems dekchen. Tar karun, a problem is a shabdara problem mevahar kora hoche to suggest a problematization. Problem bolte ita kuno rakum mane kharaap quality by hino erakum bhabe unhe bolchen na. Dostoevsky's poetics are better only at a problematization dekchen, of this clear schismatic uh, differentiation between the subjective self and the objective world. Only data dekte bachchen, J. Dostoevsky's poetics, in Dostoevsky's poetics, the subjective self of a single author is absent. Rather, there are multiple voices. That you know, he is using the term polyphonic, bohushar. So, it's like a bohushar roche. A bohushar guli, protecta ikinto is dealing with the world in its own ways. And each of these often stand in anti uh, paradoxical relationship of antinomies, which is a rector I point out, Kurchile, with the other. For example, uh, the Christian piety in, um, in in Sonia, in Sonia's words. This kind of stands in contrast with, for example, what happens to Smidrika I love in the novel. I mean, but think about it. Or uh, the, the fact that Smid, for Smidrika I love, it is impossible to redeem himself. Smidrika I love is a horrifying death. Uh, it Kind of originates from that fact that Smidrikalov cannot redeem himself. What does that tell us about Sonia's views about Christian redemption that is universal and that is all pervasive? Both these perspectives are not negated. They are placed side by side. And so the reality that evolves out of them 
is not placed in neutral static images of either অর্থাৎ কিনা আমরা না সোনিয়ার ইমেজ অফ ক্রিশ্চিয়ান পার্টিতে পুরোপুরি বিশ্বাস করতে পারছি না আমরা স্মিথ্রি গাইলভের ডুমড নেচার এন্ড ইররিকভারেবলি ডুম নেচার এবং ডুমড ট্র্যাজেডিতে পুরোপুরি সেটা সেটা দ্বারা হরিফাইড হতে পারছি রাদার both these images kind of fluctuate and interplay with each other and it is their interplay it is in that interplay in the intersubjective realm of the novel that the reality out the reality of the fiction of fiction for dostoevsky is elaborated or enunciated in the interplay of the voices that becomes important without a necessary resolution at the very end jodi dostoevsky kichu kichu khetre suggests a reconciliation kintu shei reconciliation tao kintu onek khetre vague jerokom at the end of the novel that you would be reading crime and punishment she she the kind of res- reconciliation that he suggests is a reconciliation that would come but that has not come yet she to ekhane ekta vagueness at a necessary vagueness ki kintu রেখে দেওয়া হচ্ছে and between christian reconciliation and uh, uh, and this uh, between faith and skepticism so do you think that dostoevsky was kind of uh, and was he being uh, what i'm trying to say is that uh, was he trying to be facile i mean was he playing to the gallery what was he trying to uh, reconcile the opposites which are irreconcilable in nature uh, uh... I mean, uh, from the letters that we get of Dostoevsky, he keeps on stressing. It, 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 we need to understand that many of these novels were serialized. For example, uh, the father's Karma, uh, the brother's Karmazov, or Crime and Punishment. These were serialized, right? So there were parts of it that were published earlier, and often uh, people who would encounter one serialized. a uh, part the installment of the novel would be scandalized by the uh, the kind of atheism the kind of skepticism that is offered in the text and dostoevsky would be writing to his publishers to his friends emphasizing that at the very end he would kind of tie the knots and would kind of bring about uh, a sense of reconciliation this he does specifically for the brothers karamazov because we know that uh, the grand inquisitor section for uh, especially which was in the fifth book um uh, conveys deep skepticisms about uh, christian redemption and in fact the role of the of christ in the world uh but he writes in his letters that i would resolve it in the next part or the next book so you can say that to a certain extent uh dostoevsky uh was catering to his audience because you need to understand that this was being received by an audience and dostoevsky was a professional writer he was writing uh to earn especially when he was writing crime and punishment he was in a precarious economic state uh but we can also kind of suggest that perhaps dostoevsky was not being dishonest perhaps dostoevsky did believe in a sense of christian piety but dostoevsky's sense of christian piety was not framed by uh, what he encountered in the institutionalized versions of religion about him and uh, his critique of the institutionalized versions of religion is uh, quite consistent in his novels uh, but perhaps he was a, perhaps he was a greater artist than a believer and it is here that lukacs point of view about these authors become important lukacs 
and Bhaktin stress on uh, their emphasis on uh, our ability to read beyond the authorial intention. I don't think that uh, it would be profitable for us to merely read Dostoevsky by trying to find out his intentions. And if we do want to find it out, uh, we can kind of uh, read his letters and his other writings and try to kind of find out the man who was wavering. We know that as a man, he was wavering um, uh, with bouts of alcoholism, with gambling, uh, with um, or certain reckless living. So he was not himself a man who was static in Christian piety. And it is this wavering man of many voices, if you might say, that is reflected in his novels. And that kind of brings out the beauty of his novels. Uh, so I don't think that he's being dishonest, out and out dishonest. Yes, he's catering to his audience and the reaction of his re readers is important for him. And he's shaping his novels, novel uh, by the expectations of his times. But he's also an artist who kind of uh, accepts these cultural codes, but morphs them in a certain kind of way. And it is this magical morphing which attracts us to his novels. Thank you. <coughs> I think there is an audio. Uh, sir, um, uh, can we read uh, in the chat box? Uh, All right, the, in the chat box, Momita has asked, why was Balzac a realist? Um, I have tried to point out why I would consider Balzac to be a realist uh, briefly. Uh, for example, if you may note that in Balzac's novels, uh, there is a heightened stress on the human life as it is lived on earth. Now, Balzac, we know, had a deep uh, belief in Catholicism, much like Dostoevsky has um, a certain vague association with Orthodox Christianity. But Balzac did not uh, foreground his belief in the novels that he had written. Uh, his novels are not about redemption. Uh, think about, for example, Per Gorio, uh, the novel which is kind of framed uh, in a King Lear-like uh, manner with a man uh, being uh, eventually kind of uh, looted by his daughters, if you may say so, is not a novel that eventually kind of leads to a sense of final redemption. The redemption that Balzac seeks in his novels is a redemption that is achieved by characters in this world. For example, Rastignac in that particular novel. And it is this focus on this world, the world of flesh, and yet the world that is inevitably corrupt, the world that is deeply flawed. It is this focus on this world that makes his novels realistic enterprises. They are also realist in the sense that I have discussed in association with Kant, that you see an overwhelming effect of the Kantian shift on the novels that were written in continental Europe. So you have this emphasis on uh, the limits of human reason and an elaboration of how uh, the perception of individuals shape their worlds. Balzac, in many ways, is trying to deal, trying to contrast these uh, perceptions of individuals shaping their words. For example, uh, think about, for example, a man like Felix Grande in, in Eugene Grande. He is the, 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 the kind of miserly life that he leads is not resolved, nor is Eugene's 
uh, parsimony uh, ever kind of resolved at the end. They live their own lives formed by their worldviews, as if the 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 the, the the Hopkins-like inscape of their experience kind of shapes their uh, their being in the world, right? Uh, it is this realization, a, a kind of uh, Kantian understanding of the limits of reason, the limits of human rationality, that shapes Balzac's fiction and makes it realist in this limited sense of the world. Obviously, you can all, all note Balzac's satirical take on institutions. Uh, you can note Balzac's uh, elaborate descriptions of human profanity, uh, of human day-to-day -day existence. Balzac uh, hardly ever kind of um, uh, celebrates the central character and uh, into his his central characters are often rogues right they are often unpleasant beings to begin with but it is their being in the world of uh, characters like felix rade or per gorio or uh, rastignac that kind of make us kind of uh, if not identify at least kind of comprehend the world that in which they inhabit. And it is that limited being in the world that Balzac kind of presents through his novels. And he's realist in that sense, not in the sense of, say, for example, Defoe, who would have uh, this, this extreme detailing of day-to-day uh, -to -day life of, say, uh, Robinson Crusoe as uh, one of the markers of his kind of realism. That is not the kind of realism that Balzac wants to achieve. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I think uh, there's nothing, uh, at least in the chat box, and I'm not uh, sure whether there is <clears throat> anyone else has anything to ask. But I think the important thing that you have, uh, I mean, the important takeaway, you may say, is that... Uh, Realism has these different avatars. There's a Defoean one, there's a Balzacian one, and then you can obviously draw from Kant and all that. So I think uh, this uh, realism obviously has to be uh, studied in all its complexities. We cannot have one grand kind of a definition of realism. I think that is one important takeaway I think uh, the students uh, have taken from this. I mean, you just cannot uh, typify or cannot pin down one literary term into one very set kind of a uh, definition. I think that is one uh, takeaway. Well, I, uh, there being nothing, uh, I'm not really sure whether there's anything else, no. Uh, so I think uh, we are coming at the fag end of the whole thing. And uh, thank you, Dr. Shengupta, for finding time for us. Uh, it was really a pleasure. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. It was a pleasure. Uh, it was also a pleasure for us hosting you here. And uh, staying as we do in a college is very close to us. Obviously, once this uh, pandemic uh, kind of we get over it, there will be occasion when we can meet uh, on a real medium. Maybe uh, we can have you in our college. We look forward to that. And, um, Thank you. And I look forward to you, you and your colleagues being. Any other comment, perhaps? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Hello, Rangit sir. Uh, good, uh, good evening. And I'm very much glad to have you in our uh, online meet. Uh, though I uh, know you, uh, but you don't know me uh, because uh, I went to your college uh, when there was an international seminar you organized. Uh, probably it uh, was uh, in 2017 or 18. I can't uh, remember the year now, but I uh, went there and uh, saw you organizing the seminar uh, very well. And you were in my mind. And when uh, Shantanu uh, uh, told us that uh, today uh, you were going to uh, uh, arrange your lecture, uh, then I was very much happy. And uh, also I, I am very much thankful to you to elaborate a very uh, 
not a tough topic for us but the tough topic for the students uh with your ppt and your uh, patience uh answering to the questions and the queries of our students um i would like to add um regarding the realism that uh, as i am cinema lover i have uh, observed that realism in literature is like uh, the art film where there is not the celebration of life but um the depiction of life with all its certain uncertainties just like uh, dostoevsky's uh, 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 crime and punishment ends with the uncertainty um and uh, it uh, gives you the feeling that life is um, not um, uh, like the celebration of the happy things life is full of uncertainties and you have to deal with it and um, just like uh, that there was no job certainty there was no relationships uh, relationship certainties uh, in uh, crime and punishment like the reality we have to deal with all the negative things we have to deal uh, with uh, the uncertainties uh, dostoevsky's novel also uh, tells us that and uh, realism uh, in literature also uh, teaches us how to deal with our life which is not always very good and i think the uh, i think that uh, you were very much successful in your talk because i uh, have seen my students uh, very much enthusiastic to know more from you and i am um, also very much happy that uh, you uh, with your all patience and sweetness cleared their doubts thank you uh, looking forward to the physical meeting uh, in our college or uh, somewhere else like in seminars or conferences and like the students i am also very much enriched and uh, uh, thank you and uh, i hope that uh, our students um, are uh, uh, very much enriched uh, with your talk with your uh, Uh, delivery of this uh, lecture thank you thank you once again thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much for your work and uh, looking forward to uh, right thank you thank you so i <coughs> so i think we can uh, bring uh, this uh, extension lecture to an end uh, thank you dr shengupta once again and thank you the students for being uh, patient listeners and more than that being enthusiastic participants uh, the students uh, did a lot of credit to themselves in fact i may say they have been more vocal than they perhaps are in our classes thank you thank you all i think we bring this to an end thank you thank and you good night thank you dr bas thanks